Getting the chance to appear on screen for any amount of time is a bit epic, but what do you do once you've got it? Do you stand there and sort of sway in the background, or do you go right up the front, make sure everyone knows your name, and basically steal the thunder from everyone else? I know what I want to do. I am Sean Ferrick for What Culture, and before I go on, make sure that you go and check out the original article that was written by Joshua Cooley over on What Culture itself. Here are 10 Lord of the Rings extras who got themselves noticed. Number 10, Malhor, Manflesh Orc. When you have characters as heroic as Aragorn and Theoden, you need villains equally as menacing. But when your main antagonist is a flaming eyeball, you need individuals on the ground to carry a sense of menace. Extensive design and prosthetic work was done by Weta Workshop to create the most fear-inspiring background orcs. Most of these did little more than run around, burning Rick Cotton Tree, or served as sword fodder for our heroes. But every now and then, it was important to give these characters a little more meat to chew on. After the capture of Merry and Pippin, we saw several interactions with the hobbits and their captors. Rather than just showing them as a snarling bunch of bad guys, the screenwriters helped to sell their menacing presence with a few choice lines of dialogue. Among characters like Grishnak, the poor fellow who tried to kidnap the hobbits, only to be crushed by Treebeard, we also got treated to Mahur. He was a character referenced only briefly in the book, but Peter Jackson fleshed him out, giving him the iconic man flesh line. Later, he's also heard complaining about MAGA A BREAD. Interestingly enough, the orc who delivers the man flesh changes depending on the extended or theatrical cut of the two towers. Number 9. Mumakil Mahud. Due to all the high energy action sequences in the trilogy, many of the background cast were made up of stunt performers or stunties. This was necessary not only to sell the reality of a fight sequence, but to ensure no one got too badly injured. Due to the nature of all the prosthetics required for the orcs, many of the stunt crew were able to appear multiple times as multiple characters. Shane Ranji appeared throughout the first two movies as the Witch King and a number of Uruk Hai. The work he put into his performances impressed Jackson so much that he gave him the job of portraying one of the most memorable extras in the franchise. He appears for a handful of shots without a single line of dialogue, but his presence was certainly noticed mowing down the Rohirrim off from the back of his war oliphant. The Harad chieftain made such an impression that despite his limited screen time, he was immortalised as a figure for the tabletop strategy game. Number 8. Defender of Helm's Deep from the get-go, the Battle of Helm's Deep was stacked against the forces of good. If it wasn't for the arrival of the Elves, the defenders would have been woefully outmatched. Scanning the faces of the stoic but desperate men of Rohan made it clear that few were soldiers. It was slim pickings at best. The situation was so dire that even the film's director, Peter Jackson, took up arms and manned the walls. Since his early days as an indie filmmaker, Peter Jackson has jumped at the opportunity to appear in his own movies. Sometimes it was out of necessity, brought on by budget restrictions, but also because Jackson loved it. So when it came to directing Tolkien's epic fantasy, he wasted no time getting his moment on screen. In The Fellowship, Jackson does little more than grunt while eating a carrot in the rain-sodden streets of Bree. In The Return of the King, he appears in the extended version playing a corsair of Umbar, whose only job is to get shot by Legolas. But in The Two Towers, he has a somewhat more heroic role. While the uruk attempt to batter down the gates of Helm's Deep, Jackson's character appears for seconds, hurling a spear at the attackers. Number 7. Snaga. Some of the most memorable performances in the entire Lord of the Rings franchise came from the orcs. Peter Jackson would often use extras to deliver dialogue when he felt they had something particularly special about them, and no one was more memorable than the shrill-voiced, meat-loving Mordor maggot Snaga. Snaga was one of the orcs who joined up with the uruk after they'd captured the hobbits. He was just a lowly scout and part of the ramble Grishnak brought to try and take the ring, but as hungry orc gets the better of him, pretty soon he's eyeing up the prized captive as tasty treat, only to get his head lopped off by the leading uruk Ugluk. Snaga was portrayed by another member of the stunt crew, Jed Brophy. He played several other roles throughout the trilogy, including Sharku, the orc who leads the warg ambush on Rohan. Although the name Snaga appears in Tolkien's work, it's used in reference to another orc. Tolkien also explained that Snaga actually means slave in orc speech, and was used by the larger orcs when referring to any of the lesser and smaller breeds. Number 6. Figwit when it came to casting the elves, the production team had the job of finding characters who were particularly suited to the role. Tolkien's elves were presented as angelic beings with slender frames, high cheekbones, and defined jawlines. In short, they were the supermodels of Middle-earth. It's no surprise, then, that the leading cast of elves were made up of actors like Hugo Weaving for Elrond, Orlando Bloom for Legolas, Kate Blanchett as Galadriel, and Liv Tyler for Arwen. 
but they needed striking background actors to play the elf extras. One in particular caused such a stir among the fandom that a whole internet campaign was started to identify the actor. Even a documentary was made about tracking down the famed elven stunner. The elf in question, who only appeared for a total of three seconds during the Council of Elrond and the Fellowship, the actor turned out to be one half of the comedy duo Flight of the Concords, Brett McKenzie. Fans dubbed the character Figwit, an acronym for Frodo is great. Who is that? Peter Jackson decided to bring the character back for the Return of the King as a way to honour the fanbase. Mackenzie also appeared in The Hobbit, but this time was giving an, an official name of Lindir, who was a different elf entirely. Number 5. Gilgalad. The character of Gilgalad was a central figure in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. He was the High King of the Elves, who together with Elendil formed the Last Alliance. In the books, he led the forces of good against evil, and together with Elendil did battle against Sauron. He mortally wounded the Dark Lord, allowing Isildur to cut the ring from his hand. Gilgalad was burned in the process and died, however. He was intended to play a much larger role in the films, but upon recognising the need to focus on Elrond and the prologue, the decision was made to omit him. You can catch a glimpse of him wielding a spear as he batters down an orc during the battle sequence, however. The actor who played Gilgalad, Mark Ferguson, was gracious enough to understand the reason for his diminished role, realising that Gilgalad's fate would be too gruesome to show on screen. But his character survived both as an action figure and a miniature for the Warhammer version of Lord of the Rings. Number 4. Farmer Maggot Farmer Maggot is a much beloved character from Tolkien's epic tale. In the book he's presented as a menacing individual who used to chase a young Frodo Baggins off his mushrooms. During Frodo's flight from the Shire, however, he turns out to be one of the braver hobbits in the tale. He gives Frodo and his companions shelter for the night, promising to see off any black riders who come along. For the films, his role was drastically diminished. Indeed, we barely get a glimpse of him. We see his farmer's scythe poking above the corn when Merry and Pippin bumped into Frodo and Sam after stealing a bunch of his crops. He does appear in another scene, however, although it isn't clear it's him right away. One of the first images of the dreaded Black Riders was the looming shadow towering over a hobbit hole at night. The expression of dread on the unnamed hobbit's face was terrifying. It was an iconic way to introduce the Nazgul as a force of pure evil. But for anyone who knows their stuff, Tolkien alluded to a similar encounter between the Riders and Maggot in the books. Number 3. Everard Proudfoot Like the elven extras, the actors who played the Hobbits were required to have distinctive characteristics. Chiefly, the specifications were that they needed to appear homely. The hairy hobbit feet were provided by Weta Workshop along with the curly wigs and country attire. All the actors had to do was convey a sense of living a quiet, comfortable and uneventful life. This can't have been that difficult a life because all they had to do was party up for Bilbo's birthday with flagons of ale and plates of food. But there was one hobbit extra who stuck out for their un-hobbit-like behaviour and grouchy demeanour. Noel Appleby was cast to play the grumpy old gaffer Everard Proudfoot. During Bilbo's party he has one line of dialogue as he corrects Bilbo's pronunciation of his name but it's his brief interaction with Gandalf earlier in the film that's really made him stand out. At first he seems dismissive, even disdainful of the wizard's appearance in Hobbiton, but upon seeing his fireworks he allows himself a brief chuckle. This quickly turns into a brooding snarl as he notices his wife watching him. It was one of the more light-hearted interactions before everything starts getting heavy. Number 2. Irolas Irolas was a character who appeared in The Return of the King, albeit briefly, but he served to excite fans of the books who recognised him as a nod to an omitted but important character. He appears twice as a captain of the Citadel Guard. When Faramir escapes the clutches of the Nazgul after the fall of Osgiliath, he delivers the line, It is as Lord Denethor predicted. Long has he foreseen this doom. And in a later scene he delivers the news that Faramir's task to retake Osgiliath ended in a slaughter. These brief interactions were an homage to the character Beregond. Beregond was one of the Citadel Guardsmen who befriended Pippin when he joined the service of Denethor. When the paranoid Stuart succumbed to grief and madness, Beregond was the one to save Faramir from being burned, slaying several of the Stuart's henchmen in the task. Later he was made captain of Ithilien for his loyalty. It's a storyline that was omitted from the film due to the extensive length of the script, but the homage to the character was so well received that he was given his own miniature in the tabletop board game as well as an action figure. Number 1. Aldor, Bowmaster 
When King Theoden retreated to the holdfast of Helm's Deep to wait out the impending storm of Isengard, he found it was sorely defended. He called for every man and strong lad able to bear arms to be ready for the battle by nightfall. Just to add some tension to the coming showdown, most of the available warriors were ill-suited to the task. As the camera scanned the faces for the waiting defenders, it was revealed that many were indeed old men or young boys. As the Urukai battered the ground with their pikes and cried out their challenge through the rain, the men of Rohan notched arrows and waited for the order to shoot, but one old warrior, too weak to hold his string, released his arrow early, prompting the assault on the Hornburg. The character in question was played by Bruce Alpress and given the name Aldor. Over the years, fans have grown to appreciate his small appearance, redubbing him as Bowmaster. A re-edited version of the sequence appeared on YouTube after Bruce Alpress passed away in 2020. It shows him mowing down the Urukai single-handedly, testimony to his fans' appreciation for the character. It now has over 2 million views. That's everything for our list. If you reckon any face that should have been here wasn't, you let us know in the comments below. Don't forget that you can contact us over on Twitter at WhatCulture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well. Big thanks to our entire team for putting this together. Everyone, you are awesome and wonderful. Make sure you look after yourselves and I shall talk to you soon. Thanks.